Hello, listeners. This is Legal Talk Network executive producer Lawrence Coletti. Each month, we look back on our show archives searching for favorite productions. The episode you're about to hear originally aired in April of 2016, and we're rebroadcasting it because it features Cisco's general counsel, Mark Chandler, discussing his career path, international business, automation of legal departments, and patent litigation. So stay tuned. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to In-House Legal, where we cover a variety of issues pertinent to the general counsel and in-house legal departments of small, mid-size, and large organizations. Join host Randy Milch each month as he discusses the latest developments, trends, and best practices for this very busy and often complicated area of law. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Hello, my name is Randy Milch, and I'm the host of In-House Legal on the Legal Talk Network. I'm honored and happy to have as a guest today Mark Chandler, Senior Vice President and General Counsel of Cisco. Mark is one of our most thoughtful general counsels who happens to run the legal and compliance functions at Cisco, a major tech firm. Mark is a leader in the patent, security, and legal innovation spaces. Mark, welcome to In-House Legal. Thanks, Randy. Great to talk to you. So first thing I'd like to do, Mark, is go over a little bit of your past so our our listeners can get an idea how you ended up where you ended up. You began your first in-house job at uh, MacStore, which was a hard disk manufacturer. How did you get from law school to your first in-house job? Well, you know, I remember being at a law school reunion a few years ago, and uh, I was asked to talk about my career, and I, I felt the introduction from some of my classmates should have been they wanted to hear it because they were all so surprised. It was a very random route, and my lesson from it is that if someone tells you you can do something that you don't think you should do, you probably ought to listen to them. I started out after law school working part-time for a dean at at Stanford where I'd gone to school who was a special master on a Supreme Court case and part-time building a house because I really didn't want to practice law. And in the meantime, I met a guy with a friend through a political campaign who asked me to practice law with him and one other person, so I agreed to do that. And after a year and a half, I realized that I, my instinct not to do that was correct. So I uh, applied for a fellowship in Germany. I actually had been intending to go to economics graduate school, but happened upon this Robert Bosch Foundation fellowship program and spent nine months living and working in Germany, the second part of which was in internship of sorts at uh, Siemens, the electronics company. And I found I loved being inside a company. I liked the fact that my work was directly connected to products rather than connected to keeping track of my hours. And after that ended, I took a job with Siemens in the U.S., which lasted about two years until I was to be transferred back to Germany. I found that I didn't want to go because my future boss in Germany, I had one telephone conversation with him and He asked me in German, what do I need an American lawyer in Germany for? And even though I'd been working in a marketing department and not doing law, I didn't think that question boded well. I happened to be at a fundraising event for a presidential candidate in 1988, ran into someone I'd known from my year and a half of law practice uh, who was looking for a general counsel at a company he was on the board of. And I thought that sounded better than going to work in Erlangen, in Germany for someone who didn't want me there. And I interviewed and got the job. Uh, I got it because the person I interviewed with told me that although uh, they'd interviewed a lot of people from law firms, they were very legalistic. I didn't seem to know much about law, but I seemed smart enough to do the job and he offered it to me. Well, it's always important to have your general counsel be seen not to know very much about the law, but I assume that you quickly made up for that apparent uh, shortfall. How long were you at Maxtor? Well, actually quite the contrary. I was at Maxtor for six years, which by my second year, there was a Fortune 500 company actually subsequently been absorbed into Seagate. But my lack of legal knowledge was actually a great attribute. In our industry, we always say, if you can't fix it, feature it. The feature aspect was that I was pretty good commercially at figuring out how to get deals done and finding the sweet spot that would bring parties together to finish a transaction. And in fact, that's why I've been hired. The CFO was very busy dealing with the investment community and 
closing the books and didn't have time really to be reviewing contracts and negotiating them anymore. He wanted a general counsel to essentially take on that role and make sure that the quarter got finished and the revenue could be recognized. And that's what I did. And when there was a need for substantive legal work, I quickly looked to outside counsel. And that really started me down the road of focusing the in-house function on what's important for competitive differentiation of the company and make sure that everything else is done by someone who has a ton of expertise and can be brought in on an as-needed basis. So after Maxtor, that six years ended and you went to Stratacom. How did that happen? Well, after about five years at Maxtor, we did a deal to sell 40% of the company to Hyundai, which eventually was to take the company over completely and then uh, reprivatize it and, and bring it public again. But when that Hyundai deal was completed, the executive staff all agreed to remain for uh, nine months with an incentive to stay to help with the transition to the Hyundai leadership. So I knew I should be looking for a job. I wanted to look for a job. I wanted to work for a U.S. public company. And I started interviewing with a company called Stratacom. I happened to run into a recruiter at a Bay Area legal event who was searching for someone for Stratacom, which is in the wide area networking business. I interviewed and was offered a job. I explained that I was building a house and had this retention incentive at Maxtor that I needed to finish the construction. Stratacom said they couldn't support taking over that loan, essentially. So I turned the job down. Uh, Meantime, they offered it to someone else who turned it down when he was told by someone at Cisco that Stratacom uh, wasn't a great place to work. And they offered it to a third person who found the commute too long from his house after actually starting. So about nine months later, the uh, CFO at Stratacom called me and asked if I was still available, could I start? I said, well, you gotta wait two weeks for my incentive to be forgiven. He said, fine. So two weeks later, I started working there. I had another alternative, which was with a company that was very big in the uh, PC sound business at the time, that had a management that was divided between two locations and seemed to have a lot of internal politics. And I remember saying that uh, Stratacom was growing very slowly. It was a $17 million quarter, an $18 million quarter, a $19 million quarter, but that I really liked the people and didn't really like the politics at the other place. So the stock might never be worth anything, but uh, it would be a lot of fun and it was a great group of human beings. So I, I went to Stratacom and two years later, we were a $500 million company and Cisco uh, purchased Stratacom for over $4 billion. That's how I ended up at Cisco, uh, despite the, uh, the sense of someone at Cisco, at least that Stratacom wasn't a great company. It actually was a wonderful company with wonderful people, and uh, it was a great experience for the two years there and led to my being at Cisco and having the career I've had at Cisco. So you went to Cisco, but your first job at Cisco, wasn't it going back to Europe? Well, it, it was, and Stratacom had been in the business of selling equipment primarily to service providers and very large enterprises for wide area networks. Cisco's traditional business was in the in local area networking. And there was a real need to extend the Cisco legal department as the business was growing globally. So I volunteered and the and general counsel thought it would be a good idea for me to take on that project. And uh, a few months after the acquisition, I moved to Paris and stayed there for two and a half years helping to build our European business, which is now uh, well north of $10 billion, $15 billion actually, building it to be its first billion dollars at that time. I'm interested. You were in Europe, in Paris in the late 90s. What did you take away from that experience of spending two, two and a half years outside the country? How did that affect both your worldview and how you approach things today? And also, how did it affect being outside headquarters? Was that a good or a bad thing from that perspective? Because people worry about these jobs that take them away from the core and and often wonder whether they should do them or not. I had the very big advantage that coming in from the acquisition, my my goal principally was to be able to keep working for a while as my Stratacom incentives continued to be in place at that point for a period of time as part of the transition. So I really wanted to stay and I was highly motivated. And I wasn't sure what the future would bring inside Cisco since at that time, we really hadn't learned the art of integrating other companies as effectively as we are today. And today, I think we're we're really world class at that and do a great job at retaining people and building on the technology we acquire. 
So the first thing is it, it gave me the opportunity to really learn Cisco's business away from the headquarters. And you know, the heart and soul of any company are the folks who are out there knocking on doors, dealing with rejection, moving on to the next opportunity. Still today, I feel that my paycheck may say Cisco at the top of it, but every penny of it comes from a customer, and it's only there because we have such a great sales force out there talking to customers all the time. So I love being part of the sales force. That's what I've done at Max Store, and that's what I've done at Stratacom, was really focus on making sure that our sales efforts were successful and we got our contracts completed in time so we could have revenue. So that business was growing incredibly quickly at the end of the 90s, if you'll recall. So it was a very exciting time to be in the business of providing internet infrastructure, working with a really smart, dedicated group of people. So for me, it was a great chance to get to know the company and to really build a reputation away from the headquarters as someone who got things done. Uh, And as a result, after two and a half years, I was asked to come back to San Jose and lead the worldwide sales effort from a legal standpoint. Did your time there give you any gloss on the issues that we now face between the U.S. and Europe? I mean, particularly in the line of business that you're in, questions of security and surveillance and privacy are so different between the U.S. and, and Europe. Do you take with you any, any learnings from that early period that are useful to you now? The fundamental learning from living offshore is to appreciate different cultures and how they approach problems differently. And that applies not just in those substantive areas, but more generally. And I, I really find that the time that I've spent outside the United States has been some of the most valuable development time that I've had. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I wish I could do that again, although it's impossible in my current position. One of my bucket list activities would be to live in a small town in Japan for a year and teach English. And the reason for that is it forces you to confront assumptions that you take every day. Uh, I was really glad I lived in, in France rather than other places because French culture is so distinct. And it was a lot easier to adapt to living in Germany in the mid-80s than it was to being in France in the late 90s. I joked that I chose France because if I'd moved to England, my kids would have just gotten a funny accent, whereas in France they learned another language. But I learned another language, too. At first, it was very hard to get things done in France. I didn't understand what the cultural cues were. And I felt after a few months that I wished I could move to England, that I understood why people would casually say things like in the U.S. that the French are rude and so on. But after about eight months, I realized it wasn't the French who were rude, it was I who was rude, because I didn't understand how their system functioned. And once I got the hang of the fact that it was not an interrupt-driven culture, you wait your turn, you then treat people with a huge amount of deference in the interactions, you get a very different response from people. And I could give examples of that, but I don't think we have time for it. The upshot, though, is really appreciating when people come at issues from a different perspective, how important it is to examine what your own feelings were in advance, why you felt that way, and start to appreciate where they come from. And the privacy and security issues that we're dealing with today are just one example of many where that kind of international experience is tremendously valuable. So now you're the general counsel of Cisco. Give us a short precis of what Cisco does and where it sells around the world, because I think it's important for our listeners, and it'll set up our discussion uh, in the second half of our podcast. We're in 160 different countries, and we sell internet infrastructure, the routers and switches that make up the core of the network, and we sell those to service providers around the world and large enterprises. But we also provide cloud services across a variety of platforms from collaboration to network services themselves to security services. We also provide a wide variety of products that use the basic technology of the network, such as voice telephony and video services. So that puts you stem to stern on the internet and certainly, importantly, people's interaction with it. How many attorneys do you have in your department? We have about 250 lawyers, and I have another 100 folks doing quasi-legal work as contract negotiators or doing administrative or IT functions related to the legal department. And then in a separate group, I have about 100 folks 
who work on compliance matters doing the brand protection work to make sure people aren't selling knockoffs of our products, the investigations of matters that need to be investigated for internal or external reasons, and our ethics and uh, compliance function. So it's interesting, you know, when I was the general counsel of Verizon Business and we were in 159 countries selling our services, we always had an internal debate about the allocation and the whereabouts, that is, to whom they reported of the contract administrators, contract negotiator group. In my tenure, I saw them float back and forth between sales and the legal department. You have them in the legal department. Do you think that's a much better place for them? Do you feel like you can ensure quality better when they are part of the legal department as opposed to part of the sales department? Depends on what they're doing. From a standpoint of contract negotiation, our contract negotiators and the lawyers working on contracts do very, very similar work, which is to make sure that an agreement reflects the commercial understanding between the parties, that its terms will be enforceable, and that the company can understand what it's signed up to and that what it's signed up to it's capable of delivering. And where that sits isn't so important is how well aligned it is with the other functions. For our folks that are negotiating those contracts, it's really, really important that they work very, very closely with the salespeople and the sales engineers who are on those particular accounts. Alternatively, if some of them were sitting in similar types of positions in the sales force, it would be really important that they be very closely aligned with legal. What makes it work is building the relationships between the functions so that they work as one collaborative team to achieve the desired business result. That, that to me, is more important than what the organizational structure is, and I've never, I've never had a big argument when stuff gets moved around. Occasionally, different functions have been moved into my organization. Sometimes we've moved functions out of our organization. Uh, as long as we have a common understanding about how it's going to work, it's never been a problem. You know, I agree with you 100%. Uh, Mark, it's, I also don't measure don't measure my relevance or success by the uh, number of people who report to me. Exactly, it makes a lot more sense to uh, ensure the working relationships than it does to uh, make sure your domain doesn't swell or become diminished. Those kind of things never seem to work out, as far as I can tell. Mark, you've made the point several times of how important it is for the in-house legal staff to ensure that the contracts are completed in a timely fashion, that the revenue can be recognized in a timely fashion, that the quarter can be closed, and you're confident that it's been done the right way for all the reasons that the legal department would be concerned about. You have made a special effort to use technology to help you reach those goals. Could you tell us a little bit about the technology that you've tried to implement and you have implemented and what kind of changes that technology has affected on your efforts to uh, get the money in the door? Sure. Fundamentally, the legal function is an overhead function. We don't design products. We don't build them. We don't sell them. It's rare to read an analyst report in the technology industry anyway that says you should really buy company X's stock because they have such a good legal department. That's not how we differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. But we do have an obligation to get the job done right and as efficiently as possible with the lowest burden on the company. So I'm always looking for ways to simplify what we do to speed up the ability of the rest of the company to operate, to not put legal in the middle of things that we don't have to be in the middle of. And technology has been incredibly critical to accomplishing that. So we've taken a whole series of repetitive, relatively simple types of agreements, such as non-disclosure agreements, distributor renewal agreements, leases of various sorts, and turned them into web tools that anybody in the company really, and especially the sales force, can access, customize, send to a customer electronically, have approved electronically, and then have archived or to build simple online click accept tools for other types of agreements, software licenses being the obvious one that we all see a lot of, uh, where possible. And we have tens of thousands of transactions per year that are implemented completely electronically without any human touch at all, and completely under the control in terms of timing uh, and uh, content of the uh, folks who need to implement those agreements. And when I say content, I mean within the range that we allow them through the questionnaires that they answer in order to customize the agreements. And by doing that, we've really sped up the process, increased the number of transactions we can undertake with a given size team. 
Second, we've done a lot to simplify the process of entering into more complex agreements. We've automated our templates, made it easy for contract negotiators and lawyers to customize the templates. Third, we've built a very, very comprehensive discovery lab for our litigation, and I think it's really among the best uh, in the country. We have built it around the Recomine technology, which is a great vendor to us, as well as some other tools, and put it together in a way that has brought the cost uh, per gigabyte of what we produce uh, down to levels that are lower than, than we think almost anybody else around. So the application of technology has been for those two reasons, to increase the speed of the company and to lower the costs. And we feel really good about that investment. It's been really critical to the success that we've had as an organization. I think it's a testament to your stick to it of this. I think we both know general counsels who uh, have started on these efforts and, and they falter either because it's a little bit too hard of a technology leap for their business or some other issue gets in the way. And I think it only takes a few times for your clients to be expecting some improvement and not see it to sour the relationship. So I applaud you for sticking to it and having such great results. The most important thing is to take things in bite sizes. The boil the ocean efforts that are going to transform everything often end up costing too much and delivering too little. So we would, for instance, roll out non-disclosure agreements as a tool, make sure that worked right, extend it to other kinds of agreements, uh, bring in uh, electronic signatures a step at a time so that people got used to using the tools rather than trying to do giant projects. And by using uh, smaller projects as a way to get people used to transforming the way they did their business, it made it a lot easier to get implemented. I'm very familiar with the types of efforts you're describing. We certainly have had some inside Cisco. I've been blessed by never having been given a big enough budget to try to undertake a project like that. Well, it's good that you find uh, your small budget a blessing in some respects. Let's turn the uh, conversation to something else that uh, you and I both were involved in for quite some time, and that is the set of patent issues. It sort of rises naturally out of your use of technology here. You know, where Cisco sits in the firmament, the internet firmament, it makes wonderful boxes for a lot of uses and sells those boxes to other companies to have products. It it raises some of the thorniest patent issues that there are when it comes to non-practicing entities, as I think that we're supposed to call trolls these days. Give me an idea about the size of this issue for Cisco, the patent troll issue, and what steps you think that are necessary to take to bring that under control. Yeah, I would say as our business has evolved to being much more of a cloud-based business in the last few years and much more based on recurring revenue, our attractiveness for the non-practicing entities has grown. And you're right, I prefer to say non-practicing entities. I don't like the word troll because I don't think it's helpful to demonize one's adversaries in a debate. It's a little bit like rats running through a maze. I don't think you can blame them if there's if there's food at the end. And, and that's really the problem, is that our patent system has evolved over the last 25 years to put a lot of food at the end for people who have a business model that is simply around monetizing patents rather than using them to produce products. And Justice Kennedy actually remarked specifically on that phenomenon in his uh, opinion in the eBay case uh, about 10 years ago. It's really been the consequence of of changes in the law that have allowed uh, for forum shopping, changes in the law that uh, made damages very, very murky. That's being straightened out to some extent now. Changes that made it very hard to impose costs on people who brought vexatious litigation uh, and so forth. And a lot of that is being straightened out in the courts these days, although there are some fundamental flaws that still need fixing. For us, what it's meant is we've gone from having three patent suits 15 years ago, all with competitors, to having about 60 today and in each of the last few years, almost every single one of them with a non-practicing entity. It's really quite a remarkable shift. It's the single biggest piece of my budget, is over $20 million a year, excuse me, over $50 million a year spent on patent litigation alone for the legal fees. So it's a, it's a very lucrative business for a lot of people, but I don't think there's any massive increase in infringement in the last 15 years. I think what there is is a change in the economics because of uh, legal changes that had unanticipated consequences. 
So do you think that the types of corrections that are happening via the justice system, via the court system, are going to take most of this fun out of the, of the game? Or do you think that we're still going to need structural changes via legislation, which has its own set of problems associated with success? Well, the America Invents Act in 2011 brought in some fairly robust techniques to challenge the validity of patents. In court, there's a very high burden of proof to overturn the validity of a patent. and That's probably uh, a wise thing, given the expertise in the patent office. But even the tools created in 2011 sharply limit the scope of the patent office's review. Essentially, I think patent holders feel that once they get that patent issued, however they got it, they don't want anyone to ever touch it. Uh, And that means uh, 20 years of collecting monopoly rents that may be unjustified. I think that there are some changes that could be made that would make those review procedures even more robust, although there'll be a lot of resistance to that. The Supreme Court decision that opened the door to a more balanced view of the grant of attorney's fees under the patent statute has opened that door only a little bit. And I think there's a lot more to be done to make sure that those who bring litigation that they know is unfounded be made to pay the cost that they impose on everybody else. That will take a lot of the gas out of the tank that's used for settlements that are based on litigation value alone as opposed to underlying merit of the technology. So there's a uh, There's a lot of work to be done. There's also uh, venue issues to be dealt with because right now we've set off a little bit of a a venue war with different jurisdictions competing to have plaintiffs want to file there, it seems. Over half of the defendants sued in patent suits last year were sued in one judicial district that had only 1.3 million people in it. And uh, it was simply as a result of the fact that, for better or worse, the or correctly or incorrectly, the plaintiffs believed they would get some kind of advantage by being there. And that perception, uh, justified or not, uh, undermines the, the rule of law. So we, we have some things we can still fix that need to be fixed for that system to become a lot better. Innovation is critically important. My company has over 20,000 patents. We believe in the patent system, and we believe in the incentives the patent system provides for innovation. But turning it into a Uh, a game of corporate ambulance chasing isn't the way to promote innovation. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. Let's take the final minutes here to turn yet again to something else. You know, your experience in Europe, and, and we discussed it a little bit, raises today's issues, certainly around the internet. There have been all sorts of issues about national champions in Europe over the internet and in the cloud. And many of those national champion issues have been brought to a head most recently by the Snowden revelations of a few years ago. How do you look at this from the standpoint of ensuring that your salespeople still have a good chance of selling in, in Europe where there's a little bit of issue with American companies in this regard? I think our credibility as a brand in Europe is very strong, and our European sales continue to grow. The Snowden revelations have certainly been leveraged by some of our competitors, and not necessarily those in Europe, to try to make an argument of equivalency and saying, well, don't worry about security of our products, you have to worry about their products as well. And that that does slow sales cycles, but I think we've been very compelling in demonstrating that we have no back doors. We do believe in rule of law and in complying with uh, lawfully granted search warrants. However, we have been strongly supportive of Microsoft in litigation they have with the U.S. government over having to turn over emails of European citizens that are stored on European servers. We think our government needs to go through the European governments in order to to get those documents through legal process. Uh, We filed a brief in support of Apple on the issue of the use of the All Writs Act to try to force the opening of the San Bernardino phone. But over time, what we're seeing is European governments also demanding similar abilities to do surveillance that the U.S. government has. There's legislation in both France and the U.K. right now to to that effect. And our hope is that over time, as these civil society issues are, are joined in those countries as well, we can come to some international rules of the road about how product vulnerabilities will be disclosed, 
to vendors so they can be fixed, uh, what kind of legal process is needed to get access to information that's transmitted through the internet, and and what steps it makes sense to do from a data sovereignty standpoint to make sure that information uh, stays within the countries where people who are citizens there want it to be. And all those things ought to be solvable through international understanding. We have a belief that that's the way to go, and if not, in the next six months during this presidential administration, that in the next one, coming up with an international solution that makes sure American companies are playing on a level playing field will be an important priority. Well, Mark, on that hopeful note, I want to thank you for spending time with me today on In-House Legal. It's been a hugely informative half hour, and I really appreciate you spending the time with us. Randy, it's really great to talk to you. I just miss having you as a as a general counsel peer to bounce ideas off of and, and disagree with and agree with. So look forward to talking again soon. Thanks, Mark. And I want to thank all of you who have listened to our podcast today. For all of you listeners who would like more information about what you've heard today, please visit www.legaltalknetwork.com, or you can follow us on iTunes, RSS, Twitter, and Facebook. That brings us to the end of our show. I'm Randy Milch. Thank you for listening. Join us next time for another great episode of In-House Legal. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.